All right, let's do this. So what I want to talk about today is preferred equity. I started doing preferred equity in the dark days of COVID. Literally, one of my mentors who runs a massive private equity firm sent out an email to all of the people in his network that he had done deals with in the past or people that were kind of in the orbit of maybe potentially doing deals with them. And I'll keep the name private for now, but basically he hosted this Zoom meeting out of his home and had an analyst prepare some slide decks. And it was an incredible setup. The setup was, I'm going to show all you guys how we're going to make a ton of money during COVID because I've seen these crazy black swan event down cycles before. And this is how you find opportunities in very dark times. And we're all going to make a ton of money. So the strategy he laid out was preferred equity. And it really resonated with me. At the time, I was making sure that all of our current portfolio of, I think, 10 hotels that we were managing and owning at the time were going to be able to survive these crazy times. And I was making sure our balance sheet was going to be okay and we were set up to weather this wild storm. I also knew, though, that this was probably going to be the best investing moment that I had seen in my career. I started my career in 2011, so I really missed the GFC. We saw some like later stage investments at that time, but I knew what was happening in COVID, particularly for the hospitality industry, was going to create tremendous opportunities. And what I didn't anticipate is actually how much havoc it would wreak for a lot of hotels and how long that impact would last. So I set out to raise a new fund because I wanted to have dedicated capital to go out with strength and conviction to get deals under control with this strategy of preferred equity. So the primary strategy of our first fund was preferred equity with a few direct investments on the back end. But the fund gave us the ability, even though we were going to kind of syndicate out some capital and bring in partners uh, alongside us, it gave us the ability to say we have a fund, we could technically close probably all cash if we wanted to, but we were always going to bring in these other partners. It just gave us a little bit of an edge. And literally, I raised this fund starting in July of 2020. So it was like the world was falling apart. People didn't really know how bad it was going to get. But being in the hospitality industry, it hit us harder and faster than most people. And we could kind of see the writing on the wall, see the opportunities. So that's when I was really introduced to preferred equity. And we kind of fine-tuned our strategy, our process, and our approach in real time during this period. So we made a few mistakes, but we did some tremendous deals. And now I am raising a second fund. We're going to have a first closing at the end of September to go out and do it again, same strategy, preferred equity, and then some direct investments in some experiential, highly differentiated, unique hotels. So I thought the best place to start in talking about preferred equity is to explain what preferred equity is. Preferred equity is basically super powered equity. It's equity that sits in front of all the other equity meaning it is more important, it receives distributions, it receives cash. In a liquidation event, it would get paid back first before all the other equity. Typically, preferred equity sits right behind the debt. So let's just take a simple summary transaction of $10 million. You have $5 million of debt, you have $2 million of preferred equity, and you have $3 million of common equity. The $2 million of preferred equity would sit right behind the $5 million. So let's just say in that $10 million capital stack, you sold the property and you only got $7 million. Here's how the repayment would work. The lender would get paid off first, then the pref equity would get paid the $2 million, 
And then the common equity would get nothing because there was only $7 million. There's nothing left. The pref equity in that example also wouldn't get a return. Thankfully, in our first fund, all of our deals are having a return and uh, we're getting back far more. But in the worst downside scenario, you are getting repaid before all the common equity right after the debt. The most amazing thing about preferred equity and why the opportunity for preferred equity is so big and so valuable right now is because of what's called an asymmetrical return. This is the holy grail of investing. Every investor, whether they're investing in stocks or companies or real estate, tries to find an asymmetrical return. And an asymmetrical return is when you are taking debt-like risk and earning equity-like returns. So let's just say in a normal environment, you know, debt is risking maybe 50 to 60% of the value and earning a return of 5 to 7%. Well, now you have an opportunity with preferred equity to go up maybe 60% of the value and risk from a loan to cost or loan to value standpoint and earn 18, 19, 20% returns, which are similar, more traditionally earned in common equity. That is an asymmetrical return, and that is peak risk reward management. So now that we've established what an asymmetrical return is, I want to talk about the typical repayment timeline for preferred equity. And in a normal preferred equity deal, in a normal preferred equity situation, the preferred equity is going to receive distributions in cash flow and at a capital event before all of the common equity. Now, what comes down to a negotiation is kind of in what ratio? Does the preferred equity return, you know, maybe 50% of the cash flows and 50 goes to the common? Does the preferred equity get 70% of the cash flows and 30 goes to the common? Or does the preferred equity get 100% and the common gets zero? The same scenario is evaluated at a capital event. What happens? Does the common equity get some of their capital after the preferred equity has gotten some of its return or, some, or all of its principal back? There's different timing and different negotiation that you can structure a preferred equity deal. I'm going to go through the most basic. Here's the most ba basic preferred equity example. So let's just say you have preferred equity in a deal of a million dollars. And that preferred equity sweeps 100% of the cash flow from the operations until it gets all of its money back plus an 18% compounded return. Most likely the only way to hit that IRR is at a capital event. It's very difficult to be able to kind of do that through cash flow. So now the pref equity is getting 100% of all the money coming in and it's going down to pay down its principal and attack some of the accrued return. What happens at a capital event? Again, let's keep it simple. So you sell the asset, the first million dollars that comes out, it goes back to pay down the principal 100%. Then every dollar after that incrementally is going back to pay this IRR, which in this example was an 18. Now, one critical component that we always do in all of our deals is a minimum multiple. So we will structure this where the return to the preferred equity must be the greater of the minimum multiple or the IRR. And typically how that works is after a certain amount of years, maybe it's three or four years, the minimum multiple is less than the IRR and the IRR takes over. And I'll give you a couple of real life examples as we go on as to how that works. But that's the basic premise of preferred equity. And I would say preferred equity needs to be, you know, in our investing, it doesn't go higher than really 75% loan to value. So you still have 
25% equity value behind you. We did a lot of deals during COVID where it was actually much less than that because it was a much riskier environment. Depending on the environment, depending on your knowledge of the asset and your bullishness, you know, maybe you go between 70 and 75%. But it's definitely not a situation where the preferred equity is larger in size than the common equity. That's not really preferred equity. I want to talk about another concept, and that's called last dollar basis, because that's how we as preferred equity investors think of our level of exposure. So let's go back to that $10 million example I gave you where there's $5 million of debt, $2 million of preferred equity, and $3 million of common equity. The last dollar basis for the preferred equity in that deal would be $7 million. You have the $5 million of debt, the $2 million of preferred, the last dollar basis is $7 million. Put another way, what do I have to sell this asset for to get my money back? That's your last dollar basis. And it's very important to think about that in the context of structuring a preferred equity deal because you know we're looking at a deal right now where the total capital stack could be 180 million. And our last dollar basis in the deal for our preferred equity is going to be around 130 million. So the risk that we are taking is much less than the risk that the common equity is taking because for the common equity to get all their money back plus their return, they at least have to sell the property or refinance the property at a value that exceeds 180 million. Whereas we have a much larger margin of error and can sell the property for 135 million. But this is the beautiful thing. Because this is a crazy time, the capital markets have broken down, banks aren't lending, people need capital. You know, sure, interest rates will cut 50 basis points, but I don't really think that, you know, just lights the world on fire here. And the beautiful thing is that preferred equity can get that asymmetrical return. So at my $135 million last dollar basis, I could earn a 17% IRR. I could earn 18% IRR. And that's typically a common equity level return that those guys, you know, in the $180 million last dollar basis are trying to earn. But in this deal, the sponsor is thinking it's going to be a 28 IRR. So that's why the common equity guys feel good about their $180 million position. But maybe I don't believe it's going to be a 28 IRR. I'm not willing to take that risk. So I'm good earning a 17% IRR with $135 million last dollar basis. And that's really how we're going to talk about some of the PREF deals that I'll share with you and how you should think about PREF in your own deal when you're negotiating with someone willing to give you PREF or how you might invest PREF in someone else's deal. So let's go back to some of the basic structures and the basic tenants. So in our preferred equity deals, we always have an IRR basis for a return and we always have a minimum multiple. And we like to think of negotiation as kind of a machine with multiple levers. And you could kind of pull these levers and negotiate with your counterparty. But at the end of the day, I'm still trying to solve for a high teens IRR. So what negotiable levers might we have? Well, cash flow. You might be negotiating with someone and is like, listen, the only way I could bring in PREF is if we keep some distributions for my investors because they love distributions. It's going to keep them engaged. It's going to get them over the finish line. They want some distributions. Okay, fine. So let's do this. We'll split the distributions. You, you get 30% and I get 70%. Now you might say, Jake, why would you be willing to do that? Because the whole point is you're supposed to be less risky. These guys are investing behind you. Why are you letting them eat into some of your return? The answer is pretty simple. In all the preferred equity deals that we've done and that we're looking at, we are investing in a terminal value. What we think the property is going to be worth at the end of the day. So if we have to give up some incremental cash flow to make someone happy, it's okay because the real value and the real upside for us is going to come when we sell the asset. Because of where we are investing today on a last dollar basis, we think that has enough margin. 
We think there's enough upside in the market. So we are comfortable with the terminal value. So we're willing to share a little bit of cash flow. Now, maybe we're potentially less secure in our terminal value. So we wouldn't want to share any of the cash flow. And we would not do that. We would just take 100%. But in a lot of the deals we did, we had a pretty big margin of error versus where we thought the end value would be and what we needed to be repaid for our initial investment and our preferred return where we could give up some cash flow along the way. And it was a sign of good gesture. It keeps everyone kind of motivated, keeps everyone focused on the day to day and allows us to still get to what we want to achieve. Minimum multiple is very important because as a preferred equity investor, I'm not a bridge lender. I'm not a short-term bank. We're investing out of a fund where once we invest in the investment period and I get the money back, I can't just like necessarily reinvest that in another deal. The other thing to consider is that there's not just endless amounts of preferred equity deals out there. There's not endless amounts of great deals out there. So if you're going to spend time and invest in a deal, you want to make sure the return that comes out is meaningful. What do I mean by that? Let's just say I do a pref deal and someone's willing to pay me 20%. Well, that sounds great. But what if it only lasts for two months? You know, well, what did I earn? I earned like, you know, a 1.1 1 .1 on my money. Like it's not, it's not that interesting. It's not that interesting. So we have a minimum multiple that's typically in the range of 1.6 to 1.8. So where we're basically going to, it's going to take four years, three and a half to four years on an IRR basis. And that's like a 20 IRR to get beyond that minimum multiple. So it's really important for us and probably for you, unless you have short-term money and endless amounts of deal, which I don't, I don't think you do, to have a minimum multiple. The other key thing about preferred equity is control and rights. One of the unique things about preferred equity is you have the ability to invest directly into the partnership that owns the property, whereas credit you are not investing into the partnership. You maybe have a lien on the property. You maybe have a UCC filing, but you do not have a position in the partnership. And when you have that, it's incredibly valuable because it gives you tremendous insights and controls. So some of the controls that we find are important that we structure in all of our deals are major decision controls. However, we'll allow you to sell the asset if it's going to take us out but we have the right to approve a refinance, any sort of major capital expense, any change to the business plan. We have the right to approve the annual budgets. We're actively engaged on monthly P&L reviews and monthly financial reviews. We are there just like a partner. Now, we're not really running the day-to-day. -day. That's the sponsor. That's the common equity. But we are there as a very actively engaged, strategic partner. And I'll talk more about strategic partners in a second. Another key thing about preferred equity, and we actually missed this on our first deal I'll talk about in a second, is non-subordination. So let's go back to last dollar basis. If you invest at a last dollar basis of $7 million, well, then we make absolutely clear there's no way that any money can come in after us, ahead of us. So put in other words, our last dollar basis can never exceed $7 million. So if something happens and you need to raise more money, you need more money down the road, then that money is going to be subordinate, just like a lender, to our capital that we put in. So that's a critical thing. The other thing is term. The purpose of preferred equity, and I, I should have gone into this at the beginning, but the purpose of preferred equity right now in this environment are for a couple things. So let's just go over need for preferred equity. One, simplest one, it could be to extend a loan or pay down a loan. Great use of preferred equity because from the common equity standpoint, they get more time to figure out the business plan. From the PREF standpoint, you're basically replacing cheap money with expensive money and you're going lower into the capital stack. Everyone's happy. CapEx, all these hotels struggled through COVID. They didn't reinvest capital back into their asset. They need to reinvest into the asset now. So CapEx project, another great use of preferred equity because you should get a good ROI in spending money 
to enhance the property. Another use of preferred equity is working capital, interest reserve, operating reserve, things like that. What is not a use for preferred equity? For us, it's typically buying out common equity. We would only, only do this in some situation where maybe there was a single common equity investor and they had a very low leverage debt and they were willing to kind of trade a piece of their you know, low leverage, low loan to cost position to swap out preferred equity. But we'd better be damn sure that we understand the business plan, that we have confidence in the business plan, we have confidence in the sponsor, that they're not trying to run off with like the last bit of cash that they can and we're not getting duped. We've seen like some preferred equity deals where people come to us and they're like, hey, you know, we've got like $20 million in the deal. How about you guys put preferred equity in a 15? It's like, how about not? Because your 20 million is probably like 10 today. And, you know, we don't exist here just to pay you guys off and to give you some sort of big windfall. Maybe if we like the loan to value, but in many cases in a distress rescue United situation, that's not how it works. So those are some of the uses of preferred equity. One of the other unique things about preferred equity that's very different from credit is preferred equity doesn't need to be paid current. So that a preferred return will just accrue. So if you are a sponsor and you're evaluating mezzanine debt versus preferred equity, preferred equity is an unbelievable option because MEZ has a UCC filing on your property and will require in most cases full payment current or partial payment current. And if you miss a payment, they will foreclose on your property. For us, most often, we structured it as an accrual. If there was cash available to pay us, we would sweep it 100%, maybe something less if that was negotiated. And if there wasn't cash immediately when we started, eventually we think there will be cash and we would get that accrual. And if there's only cash that comes at a capital event, well, now I've had an 18% compounded return just continuing to clip. And that's going to be an awesome day for me at the end of the day, assuming we made a great investment and we liked our basis and there was enough spread there from a last dollar basis to the value at the end of the day. Let's talk about um, some pitfalls of preferred equity. So one of the things that you need to be careful about, like we talked about, the minimum multiple. I think you need a minimum multiple because you're not short-term capital and there's not enough preferred equity deals for you to earn an IRR that's really interesting. You could earn a great IRR if you invest for one day and you get your money back the next day plus a little bit more. But on a multiple standpoint, it's not going to keep the lights on. So a minimum multiple is very important. The other critical thing is really mapping out controls and rights. And you really need to think always downside scenario. Because keep in mind, when you're investing preferred equity, maybe it's for an acquisition, but it could also be in a rescue situation or to solve a problem. So you can't just say, well, the worst is never going to happen because the worst certainly could happen. So you want to kind of game out these scenarios and make sure you have adequate controls and rights in place and be able to step in and take over as necessary. In our preferred equity deals, we have the ability to step in and take over if the sponsor lies, cheats, or steals, does something um, that violates a major decision, does something that violates another covenant, or doesn't take us out in time. So another pitfall I want to talk about is non-subordination. And this was really the biggest pref equity mistake we made. We made it on the first deal and we never made it again. And essentially our doc wasn't solid enough to make clear that, that the common equity couldn't like increase the size of the senior loan and as a result, push our last dollar basis out. It was clear that no other equity could come in front of us, but it wasn't crystal clear whether they could increase the size of the loan and push us out. And I don't think it was tight enough that we had major decisions over, over the loan either. 
because the anticipation was always that they'd refinance in a year. So we understood that, but we didn't anticipate that they'd be able to refinance to a slightly larger loan. And our last dollar base just got pushed out. Ultimately, it's fine because it wasn't that much money and it was really to fund an interest reserve. So it made things better, but it was a mistake that we made and we'll never make it again. And the simple way to solve it is just to make explicitly clear in your partnership agreements that your last dollar basis can't be beyond a certain amount. So the amount of debt and preferred equity can't exceed X number. The other thing that's, I would say a pitfall potentially for the common equity that they really have to be aware of or a sponsor is the term. In all of our deals, we have a term because our intention is not to be in this deal forever. We want to make a good investment and get out of the investment and help the common equity or the sponsor solve a problem. But ultimately, we want them to pay us off, refinance us, sell the asset, whatever. So we'll always have a term in all of our preferred equity deals. Typically, it's around four years, but it would be less maybe if there was only three years left on the loan, we wouldn't want to be stuck in a situation where the loan expires and you know we don't have the ability to force a sale or force the liquidity event of our position before that loan expires. So we'll always have a term. And what happens at the term, once the term hits, you know we'll have kind of a window in there where we can initiate a sales process. We can tell the sponsor to initiate a sales process or refinance process. And if they don't achieve that, then we could take that process over ourselves. I'll give you an example um, of a term issue we had. It wasn't really an issue, but in one of our early preferred equity deals, we had a, it was like a 16% IRR and we had a pretty generous back end. And once the common equity got their money back, we then participated in like a back end split. I think it was like 90, 10. So we got all of our money back plus a 16 IRR. The common equity just got its money back. And then we kind of split all cash after that 90-10. So we were kind of motivated to increase the value of the property as much as possible. Well, we made this investment literally during the middle of COVID, like right at the beginning of COVID in the middle of the summer, when like places were closed, like it was the craziest time ever. And the amount of time it's taken this property to recover has been longer than we anticipated. So we had a four-year for sale right, and that came up this summer. We made the decision like, hey, we think we're money good right now, plus our basic 16% return, but we think there's better opportunity for us to get into maybe some of our back end if we wait till next summer or spring to sell the asset. So we just said, hey, sponsor, we have the right to do this. We're not going to exercise our rights. We're going to stay in and exercise them later. And they're like, great, that's a huge win for us. You know, We're not going to get hurt. And thank you. And we decided to do that. But we certainly could have done it the other way. But our reputation, we want more business. We like the sponsor. We have other deals with them. We didn't see it as a risk to stay in. And we decided to stay in and uh, and we'll sell it in the spring. Now I want to talk about why preferred equity is better than private credit. Everyone's talking about private credit right now. Banks aren't lending. So there's tons of private credit lenders out there. I'm sure most of the people doing deals right now are with, you know, unless you're Blackstone, with kind of private equity funds that have a credit arm or hard money lenders or folks like that. And from an investor standpoint, I think preferred equity is better than private credit because it allows you to earn a larger return while taking very similar amounts of risk. You're taking a little bit more risk because oftentimes our preferred equity is at a higher LTV than a private credit lender would be. Not all the time though, but we are in the partnership. So while a private credit person has to foreclose, has to go through a process, UCC filing, we are already in the partnership. We are written into the docs. So we have advanced rights. We can see things coming. We have certain controls. We don't have to wait till things get really bad before we step in and take over. It's whatever the docs say. We are already in there. And in a lot of ways, that's better than private credit. Obviously, you can get a private credit guy on here and he'll tell me I'm crazy and wrong. But um, for us, we're definitely a little more opportunistic. We're trying to earn a greater return. 
I think the asymmetrical return is most obvious and glaring today in preferred equity than it is in private credit. It's great in private credit, but I think it's just slightly better in preferred equity. And we are also equity investors ourselves. We are operators, we're vertically integrated. So in the hospitality space, we have the ability to take over. So we feel much more comfortable than a lender or a private credit person to do preferred equity because this is what we do day to day. And we have no problem being more active if we need to, being more of a strategic partner if we need to. Whereas private credit could be like a hedge fund in New York that literally adds no value to you, no value to your deal, doesn't have the insights into your industry that we would have as a preferred equity investor. And when shit goes wrong, like they could basically tell you to fuck off and, you know, get nasty. And we might be more willing to work out things because, you know, we have more comfort in the asset, in the space, in the business plan, in the operations, et cetera. The other thing I want to talk about is deal size and kind of like who would want or take preferred equity. You know, Warren Buffett invested preferred equity in Wells Fargo, I think, in the great financial crisis. So that example is counter to a lot of what I'm going to say. But what we found during COVID is the people that needed preferred equity or, yeah, pref equity were not private equity investors or like big sovereign wealth funds. Like they have plenty of money. They have these big funds. They can draw down reserves in their funds to cover shortfalls to solve issues. The people that need preferred equity were entrepreneurs, mom and pop operators, smaller vertically integrated operators, and uh, families that maybe like have an investment in a property or a hotel, but like it's not their day full sole business. They're the ones that need preferred equity because they might be more impacted by liquidity. Now you could certainly share some examples of private equity funds that had liquidity issues because their investors weren't funding. And you know that might be an opportunity, but typically we found the best options in those types of deals. And those types of deals tended to be smaller. So we also found an advantage in doing kind of like, I mean, we had an institutional partner that was doing a lot of the deals with us, but it was like sub-institutional deals. Like all of our deals were really started out below $15 million. And we would go down to as low as $3 million. And a lot of the big private equity funds, those that's just too small for them to you know get out of bed for. It's just too small for them to think about. But that's a mistake because when you get into a deal, let's just say for 10 or $15 million as preferred equity, that might not be the end of the investment. There might be other opportunities once you're in the deal to invest more capital in a tactful, strategic way. So the 10 or $15 million investment might lead to a 20 or $30 million investment down the road in a variety of different ways. What are an, what is an example? An example might be you're in the deal in pref for 10 to $15 million. The deal starts to turn around, but like, you know, you as the pref investor sweeping all the cash flow, the LPs in the back are just saying like, oh, I need liquidity. Um, you know, I need to put it in my own business. I need to put it in this other deal. I, I need the liquidity. I don't want to be in the deal anymore. Like, I don't even want to wait. I know things are going better, but I don't want to be in the deal anymore. So you as a preferred equity investor kind of being in the partnership, hearing some of this chatter around could go to some of the common equity folks and say, you know, I'm sure you don't want to do this, but I'd be interested in buying out your common equity possession for 50 cents on the dollar. And you know what will happen? The guy will tell you, fuck off. I'm not doing that. 50 cents on the dollar. What do you think? I'm a chump. And then the next day they'll call you. They'll be like, you know what? I think, I think I'll take 55 cents on the dollar. And um, and that's what they'll do. And uh, and they want it. And uh, and they'll take it. And then now your 10 or $15 million investment is like a $20 million investment, a $30 million investment. So I think it's a big opportunity, a missed opportunity for a lot of the larger guys that that miss that. When we were doing pref equity during COVID and we're about to do it now, we looked at it like this. We deployed, I think, with our partner probably somewhere around $50 million in preferred equity. And that allowed us to control about $650 million worth of real estate value. Think about that. 
I invested $50 million with our partner, and now I control $650 million worth of real estate. Well, how do you control it? Well, I'm in the partnership. I have full major decision rights. I have all the control rights that you would have as a pretty much a GP or a sponsor. And there's a lot of things that can happen in $650 million worth of real estate that gives us additional opportunities to add value, create value, deploy more capital, or get a liquidity of our position. So it's a very unique opportunity to be able to do that and control that amount of value and be in that amount of deals. The other thing I want to talk about is what happens if you invest preferred equity and you know the deal needs more equity. Well, you, you don't have to put in the additional equity. And that's really the common equity and the sponsor's problem to figure out. And if they go into default or if they run into hard times, then as the preferred equity investor, I can kind of take the deal over and decide whether to fund it or do what I want to do. But what we would always do is build in a loan if we felt that the sponsor was going to need more money. Sponsor is never going to tell you how much money they need. They're always going to ask for the least amount of money possible because PREF is expensive. They don't want to pay it. And by the way, I was having an argument with uh, Charles, who works on my team today, that PREF, in my opinion, is actually not expensive. And I can tell you why. And if anyone tells you PREF is expensive, here's what you say. And we'll, we'll go into that in a second. But what we would do is we would build out the ability where they could draw down additional capital from us at a predetermined amount in a predetermined time frame, at a predetermined rate. And for us, it was 20%. And in a couple deals, we knew they were going to need more capital and they needed more capital. They just didn't want to take it because they were the optimists. They were thinking it would turn around and I don't really blame them. So they came to us, hey, we need more capital. Yep, we got this line. We'll put an extra million and that's going to be at 20% now. And that was funded as a loan. So that's what I'm talking about with these add-on things where maybe a $10 million investment goes into an $11 million investment or $15 million investment. Now let's talk about like a common objection and then I'll go into some Q&A. Common objection that we get is, no, no, that, that PREF is too expensive. PREF is too expensive. Well, first of all, I think it's a complete fallacy right now that anyone's out there giving PREF at 14%, okay? It's just like not out there. Like debt is at 12%. Who is putting equity in at 14%? That doesn't make any sense. That means like in the boom times when debt was like 4%, you would have people like be happy with like a 5 or 6% IRR? Maybe. I, I don't think so. So I don't buy it now that PREF equity is at 14%. But it's definitely not more expensive. What's expensive is common equity. Common equity is expensive. What do I mean by that? If you have a deal that's a 25% IRR, that means you're paying your common equity investors 25%, okay? If I'm the pref in that deal and I'm only looking to be paid 18%, how are you telling me that's expensive? Because if you didn't have me in there as the pref, you'd have common in there and you'd have to pay them 25%. Now you only have me in there as the pref, you have to pay me 18%. That extra difference, that extra between 25 and 18, that extra 7% IRR, where does that go now? That goes to your comment. So that makes their 25% IRR maybe like a 26, 27, 28 IRR. So it's actually improving their returns. So when someone says it's expensive, actually, I don't think it's expensive because it's going to drive the returns on your comment if you're confident on the business plan and your performance. Now, if you're just BSing me and all your performance is bullshit, I'll probably snuff that out and won't do the prep. But if that's correct, then... um. Maybe it is expensive, but you're showing your cards a little bit. So um, I, I don't believe that PREF is expensive and we're market priced. That is an entire primer on PREF equity. And I'm sure I missed a million things, but we have a little bit of time left for Q&A if there's any questions on that. Jake, how do you think about... Um... Like, how do you protect yourself against the sponsor defaulting on their loan? Because that would trigger all sorts of penalty interest, legal fees, et cetera, push out your last dollar basis. 100%. So that would be an example of a default under a joint venture agreement, which would give us the right to take over 
So what we would do is we would cure the default on the loan. And this is a great question, David, because in nine out of 10 of our PREF deals, we are recognized by the lender. So you know we had to come into the partnership agreement. So they had to mend their partnership agreement. In a lot of cases, we actually negotiated for the benefit of everyone with the lender because we we're a strategic partner. We we're coming in as like a white knight rescue. So we, the lender knows who we are, but a key thing that we have is notice. So we would get the same notice the sponsor would get that they're in default. Hey, they missed a payment. And we would have the opportunity to say, the sponsor, hey, what happened? You know, we could step in, we could do those things. Um, but we also are a very active asset manager. So we have three month cash flow forecasts on all of our preferred equity deals. So we are, you know, seeing the cash and ability to pay real time. And, you know, if a sponsor is like lying, cheating, or stealing, we'll eventually find that out and, and we'll have the ability to, to cure everything. But in a normal situation, if there was going to be a, a debt issue that was kind of coming down the pipe and we could see it, um, we would, if there was really no other option, probably look to force a sale if the timeline didn't allow, you know, put in some short term capital to shore up the lender. Is there ever a situation where you could just step into their shoes and take over the deal? Yeah, we can. That's it. That's it. That's our control rights. It's like, we're the GP now. Like we yeah. have the control motherfucker. Let's go. You know, but you, I mean, you can force a sale, but can you actually like fully step in and, and keep the deal? hundred percent. Oh assume, yeah. Assume the debt and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because we're recognized by the lender. So in our lender provisions, we have the right to step into the GP shoes. So they so are how, underwriting us as a sponsor. How would that work? Like if I were on the other side and I were taking the prep equity and I was the one that defaulted through, you know, obviously I wouldn't want to do that, but if it happened and then I was on a personal guarantor as well, and then I got pushed out of the deal, you step in, am I still a personal guarantor and now you've got the deal? Um, in some cases, yeah. I mean, that would be a negotiated point. Um, I think in a deal, we had that situation. I can't remember where we would land. I mean, obviously we would try and, you know, keep you on the guarantee, um, as well. Now we wouldn't do anything to make it more likely that they would call your guarantee, but, um, let's just say you know, the loan default, the only way your guarantee would be called if the loan defaulted, there wasn't enough money to repay it. So then our pref would be wiped out anyways. And, you know, we would be like working for, you know, we wouldn't be stepping into your shoes to cover that. But it's, it's a negotiable point. Now, you know, in that negotiation, you can have like a guarantee agreement, like a, you know, reciprocal agreement between the two people um, where like, you know, if we cause something to trigger your guarantee, you know, then maybe we had to, you know, pay for it or reimburse you for it or something like that. Mm. Or if we did it like maliciously, but if it was just like a bad deal and like we didn't, like it was going to happen anyways, then, um, you know, we wouldn't just assume the guarantee of the loan. No. Makes sense. But it could be a situation where like, you know, we don't want to sell the asset, but you default on the loan and we just renegotiate things with the lender and then we just get things back on track and we keep going. And then like, you're not blown out. You're just like an, your common equity investor with no rights. So what would happen then is let's just say the deal turned around, it's a home run. Once we got paid off as the preferred investor, then the distribution waterfall would be the same as we negotiated. So you know, you might get a great return at the end of the day, actually. Like maybe it just turned out that you were like a bad operator and a bad GP, but you invested in a good deal and you had a good business plan. You just couldn't execute it. Well, if we came in because we had to and executed. Like our deals are not punitive where you would somehow be like hurt. And the, you know, the deal structure and the waterfall stays as it is. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, question. If you're on, so, if you're on the other side of the table, putting together a new deal um, as a co-sponsor, what uh, like what's the framework you think is good to think through to figure out if you should consider pref in the capital stack? Um. Well, 
one, if you have a gap in your equity, that's just an obvious thing. Like maybe you just, you've called all your friends, you've spoke to all your connections and this is the most equity you can raise. Um, another thing that could happen is the lender might say, Hey, you know, when you sign the term sheet, they're going to be at 60% loan to value. And then three weeks before closing, they say, you know what, we're going to be at 55%. Now you have this gap, great way to slot in preferred equity. Another way could be frankly to juice the returns for your common. Like if you're really confident in your deal and you can put in preferred equity and you're willing to kind of trade that, then you're basically replacing an investor that you have to pay 25% to when you only have to pay us 17%. <clears throat> right. So like and, and then the, the balance of that goes to your other investors. So their returns going to increase. Mm. So preferred should always be accretive because the IRR on it will always be less than the IRR on the common. It's accretive if the deal truly like pans out. Now yeah. it, it's not going to be accretive if, you know, the deal return is like a 15 because then, you know, we're going to get a 17, but because we're, you know, part of that capital stack, what's going to be left for the common might be maybe a 15 or a 14. Right. So if deal return ends up being higher than the pref IRR, it helped the deal. Yeah. But you also have to think about it. Like what's your alternative? Your alternative might be you lose the asset and all your equity gets wiped out. So would you want all your equity would, to be wiped out or would you like to be able to survive and fight another day and maybe get all your money back? or get your money back at a 10% return, you know, it's not just zero sum. There's a bunch of different scenarios that could work out. And um, it doesn't only have to be in rescue situations. It could be like you're just doing a new deal and instead of taking mezzanine, or maybe you want to just take less debt because you could have a strategy where it's like, listen, I just, I'm a lower leverage guy. I like to be lower leveraged. And you told me, Jake, that you'll structure pref with an accrued return. So that means like, I don't have to pay you current and that's going to be helpful because then I just don't have this noose around my neck. I don't have this constant pressure to be able to, you know, feed that debt monster and I could pay you from available cash flow or pay you when we sell it. So maybe you just want to have 50% leverage and still have a strong return at the end of the day to your investors, but you don't want to have the requirement to pay you know, maybe the difference between 50% loan to value and 60% loan to value current. So you plug in pref in that little slug and that's not paid current and that's accrued. And if there's cash flow, then we get the cash flow and it's paid down, but at least maybe it allows you more flexibility in your business plan. Cool. Thank you. hundred percent, hundred percent, you know, and, and some pref deals we do you know, our return might be capped. Some of it, the back end might be shared with the common, but some of it could be capped. So part of what you might want to do is you might say, listen, I'm going to hold this thing for 50 years. Like this is a world-class asset. I'm never going to sell this. So I don't have all the equity I need right now to fund the deal or to put it together. So I'm going to take on pref and then eventually I'll just reef and I'll cap the pref or I'll structure a deal where like, they do have a back end, but maybe the back end is like crystallized at a value at a refinance. So then you can take me out as the pref. And then now you own the deal hundred percent with like your few friends because your, your pref is gone. So you guys forego some early returns to own this thing free and clear yourselves forever. Thanks guys. Hope you, uh, hope you enjoyed it. I'll keep you posted on the pref deals that we do. All of our investment pipeline right now is all preferred equity. So that's primarily what we're looking at. And uh, the first deals we do in the new fund are all going to be pref, I think, because that's just the most actionable opportunity right now. And I'll leave you with this. One of the things that I really believe in preferred equity in the way that we underwrite deals is it has to be like simple and it has to be obvious. If nine out of 10 things have to come true in order for you to get your money back as a PREF investor plus your return, 
probably not worth it. If like two out of the 10 things can come true and you get your money back plus your return, that's a great deal for Pref. Great deal for Pref. Hey everyone, it's Jake here. Thanks again for joining me on this conversation. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. Lastly, don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Jay Warzak. I'll see you in the next episode. Jake Warzak is the founder and CEO of Dove Hill Capital Management. All opinions expressed by Jake and his guests are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Dove Hill Capital Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and does not reflect or represent real estate, financial, or investment advice. Thank you.